Hello, the Arizona Pastel Artists Association welcomes you to a marvelous demonstration and talk by artist Tony Elaine. And um, we actually had this demonstration a few days ago and I, your Zoom host, Dodie Valentine, I made the error of not hitting the record button until about five minutes into the demo. So I'm giving you an introduction now, and then we'll segue right into his marvelous program. I would like to introduce Tony Elaine, an internationally acclaimed artist who lives in Scotland. So we zoomed to his studio in Scotland, where instead of one o'clock our time, it was nine o'clock his time at night, and he was a trooper. Tony says he is self-taught, and he is a pastel painter of color, light, and movement. He has um, been internationally recognized, belongs to the Pastel Society of London, of New Zealand, Pastel Society of America, the Royal Society of Marine Painters, and has exhibited and won awards at, all over the world. Um, one was an international exhibition of pastels in Suzhou, China. Tony teaches extensively. Some of his workshop themes are catching the light, mood and atmosphere, and weather, how to see it and how to paint it. I'd like to read a quote on the first page of his website. It is, the quest for perfection brings with it the fear of making mistakes and can result in a style which can seem inhibited. I am not interested in pure representation. My work is about response to the mood and atmosphere. I'd like to show you a, a couple of his works and show you the picture that he's going to work from as he does the demo. Here's Tony, he works plein air most of the time. A work on the front page of his website currently. I wanted you to see his website address, tonyalainefineart.com. And this is the scene near his home that he has photoed and will do the demo from. He made the comment that it's rather dull and he plans to up the color. Just wait till you see what he does. So now I will uh, segue into the demo. We lost about five minutes of his introduction. My apologies, enjoy. So, um, now, uh, now let's get some, this lot here, there's some, there's the bank of trees here. So the horizon line, where does the water start and where does it finish? It starts about there, I think. So we know that there is another value and color there of these trees. And um, I'm just going to suggest uh, some of these trees in the far, <clears throat> excuse me, the far distance, um, because I don't want to get too, too much detail. <clears throat> excuse me. I'm a firm believer in, in you paint what you see and not what you know is there. So, um, so I can just see one or two of these these trees in the in the far. 
far distance. Um, Then that make it too violent. So there, that'll do. Now where are we going? Well, I think it's time we we added some some of this uh, undergrowth and foliage here in this area. So I'm now going to find. Um, I've got sort of a muddy green, which which I think might might work for us. Um, And, and I can put that in there. And then quite a bit of it over here. And then we can we can block that in. Um, now, uh, the reference photograph, we are going to put some snow. Um, so I want to start. Uh, uh, if let me just turn that the let me just turn this around. You can see on the on the photograph here that there's sort of dry grass and what have you. There's just a little a little patch of snow there. Um, so the winter was sort of coming in. Um, so what I want to do is to um, just increase the the snow a bit because we want to make it a lot more interesting. So uh, let's put some snow. Remember, we paint from dark to light and from thin to thick. So what's the color of dark snow? Well. Blue. So let's put in um, all of this. It's not dark enough. Let's get some. Let's get some dark stuff in the oh, this one here. In the shadows there. And then maybe just we've got some real dark um, rocks down here that that sort of tumble down into the water. So we'll put those in. I'm using a really dark sort of Prussian blue. And then this side we've got some some more darks that go down there. Um, and there's those stones there. And then something like that. Um, now, we will put some of that dried grass in here and, and around the center. But I want to put in, again, painting from dark to light. So let's put in that one first. And then maybe just a little hint of, um, uh, this one? No. Um, this one here. Um, now, I am still squinting, believe it or not, even though I'm this close to the easel. Um, well, that's not bad. We can get away with this. Now, this side, uh, now we want to get that bank here. Um, it's quite a soft edge here. It comes out to about there, and that will be reflected down. And then that needs some more snow shadows on that side. And I think I will probably, not quite as dark as that, but I think what we'll do is I'll just put a few patches of snow there, just blend that in. And I'll stand back and take a little wee look at this and um, That's not bad. Now, I think now it's time to start pulling everything together now. 
um, this one, or is it that one? This one. So let's get all this clump of trees. I mean, there's a mass of trees here, a lot of uh, bare wood, the, you know, the leaves are sort of disappeared. It is winter. And so let's just get all of this done. Um, so I'm going to show you, hopefully, an easy way of putting in all this, all this stuff here. And we know that there's a lot of light going on there. Lost that one. And then some more foliage and branches and all that sort of stuff there. Now let's get back to our black. Oh, here it is. And then we can now start to think about um, indicating some of these uh, tree trunks if that are in that are in in, uh, in the in the background. With lots of dark, um, dark twigs and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then again, here, of course, we've got massive. And see, they, they, these are really good because, you know, they're square shapes, so you can get some nice, nice. Uh, sort of linear marks everywhere. Still squinting. Now here, this let's indicate these shadows of the of the bank again. That that sort of dark area there, and um, just there. And then, of course, this is really dark here. There's some big rocks that are sticking out. start on the water. I think that's important now to get this, to get this, the reflections here. And You can tell I'm concentrating now because I've stopped talking. Um, there's a few bits uh, down there. I'm pressing quite hard now because I want to fill up, you know, the whole pause and the tooth of the paper. Let's just bring back our a little bit of pink because we need to put that a little bit of pink in there. And then there's quite a quite a nice area of um Blue violet again. I think it's the mountains. So we can put that in. And then the river. It's going to lighter blue out because the further it back it gets, the lighter uh, the water becomes. And it's about here. Oh, 
Blimey. Uh, I don't usually paint with an easel and tripod between my legs, unfortunately. This is what I need to, um, to get this side. Get that straight line going if I can. It's always difficult to say when you've got a you've got to straddle around a, a, a tripod, which is basically right in front of the easel. Um, I'm just going to tidy up the bank here because I'm going to get those areas. There, there's going to be a load of snow in here anyway, so that's not too, too much. It's not, it's not a big issue. Um, put that pink back. We don't, we finish with the pink. We finish with that and we finish with that. Mm -hmm. And now I think we need to start doing these these trees now. Um, and I need to find the thunderstorm pastels again. Here we are, there's one. And let's indicate these trees again. So, got that on there. And then there's another one next to it. And there's all sorts of stuff going on here. And then there's a couple there. Let's get back here again. And then we've got another one there. And believe it or not, this out of sight, there's a whole bunch of branches which are hanging over and creating a right old mess there. There are two main trunks, and we're going to echo that in the water. Now let's get back to um, the bank over there, that dark blue, which is the um, where the snow is piling up here on these stones. Just a wee bit over there, of course. Now the next colour is going to be sort of a dusty pink is going to come out because I want to catch, um, I'm not going to do a dusty pink, let's change it completely. Let's get a nice sort of turquoise out, that'll do. I've got a new pastel uh, here uh, and um, I'm going to use this to Pick out some of the some of the light on on these tree trunks uh, because they they're sort of um, silver grey, but but in this light, I think um, we can do them like this nice sort of turquoisey colour and this. There is one all by itself. It goes up there. So, so I, I thought we'll just play around with some, some boughs there. And then this side, we need to balance it up, of course. So uh, I did say that there's these two here. So let's indicate that one. And maybe a bit of that there. And of course, that will have a reflection in the water. Uh, nothing too serious. And there's a few spots here and there. Um, we're still back. 
And what's the time? Well, it's time I was going to bed, so let's finish off. Um, now the snow. Um, Now we know that, um, well, I can see by my reference photo, I think it's snow, it, it could be, it could be rapids or whatever, but I'm going to paint what I see and I think it's snow and it's about here. So, um, there's patches of snow under the, a nice big patch there. We put that a wee bit in there i stand back and we'll take another another peek at this, make sure that um, you know, it, it, it's not going stupid. So um, it's a thin layer of snow there. And then of course, it continues to the other side of the bank there. Um, but let's do the snow that's really up, up close and personal. Um, now there's a big, big chunk of it there. And it wouldn't hurt actually to put a few bits in the water there, just as reflections. Um, and here, I'm going to try and find the, the untouched paper, the paper that's had no pastel on it at all. So let's see if we can And there's a big clunk of it up against that tree and a wee bit there. I'm going to stand back and take another little look at this. Well, that's okay. Um, and then, of course, there was... Um, where that dry grass is now, I'm going to put... I'm going to put the snow. And there's a few bits here and there. Um, and there's one or two bits which are catching um, in the tree. And let's have a little stand back here. And um, I think that'll do well almost. Um, next thing we need to do, or I need to do, is um, make this water a little bit more realistic because there's a few ripples and then actually there seems to be a log floating in the water there but I don't want to put it in. Um, Now, I think, let's just bring this camera around now and, uh, and let's just see if we can see. Oh, you might want to see both of them together, I guess. Yeah, that's the uh, end of game. So, so there's a quick, um, a quick demo on how to turn a pretty mundane scene into something with a little bit of color, a little bit of, a little bit of excitement, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, it's finished. It's great. Yeah. Did you say earlier, Tony, that you can do a dozen paintings a day? Uh, on a good day, I've done that, yeah. Six in the morning, six in the afternoon. Wow. Um, but, you know, um, it, it, that's on a really good day. But generally, uh, I, if I'm stuck in the studio, um, 
and um, I've got no errands to run and um, um, and I've got a full stock of pastels, you know. I mean, I, I seem to have an awful lot of pastels here. I believe it or not, I keep ordering them each day because, uh, for instance, the, uh, the snow scenes, um, the white, I use the uh, Schmincke pastel. I use the Schmincke pastel here. Uh, they're very, very soft, very buttery. And um, I've just used a whole stick on, on, or half a stick on just on what, what I've done this evening. So um, I'll be back on the, online tomorrow and ordering some more. Um, but I've got my favorite colors, of course. You know, I've got the primaries, most of the primaries, uh, and then a whole bunch of, uh, bunch of neutrals, um, which I use all the time uh, just to fit in. Um, as you can see in the distance, hopefully you can see, you know, in the background, in the background here, we could just get a whole bunch of trees. We've just warmed it all up. You know, if you look, there's, there's trees there. Um, the mountain's roughly the same shape. It, it's, it's not important. It's just to get the feel of the place, you know? Uh, I'm, I'm not a photo journalist, so I don't expect, and I don't, it doesn't worry me if the person who lives in the house that's down there sees this painting and says, hey, hang on a minute, that rock's in the wrong place. You know, that was, that's not there. That, it should be a little bit more, it doesn't worry me. I, I, I'm here simply to record my story, the way I see my world. And, and I want that world to reveal itself to me so that I can then show you how I want to see it. Um, does that sort of make sense? It sounds a bit like Chinese to me, but there, there we go. Okay. So, are you as loose as this when you're doing, like, say, a building? Say again, sure. Uh, uh, when you're doing buildings, you know, like the New Mexico picture you just did with the car, the old truck, and the buildings. Uh, can you be as loose as this? Yeah. Let me just. Where is it? I've got it here. It's framed, isn't it? I've got it over here. I mean, that's. Um, Oh, I was quite pleased with that. Oh, here he goes. Come out, boy. You can do it. Um, let me just see if I can put it on the easel here. Because um, I was quite pleased with this, with this guy here. Because... Um, don't fall. Whatever you do, don't fall. Let me turn the camera around. Oh, wrong way. What am I doing? Back to meeting. Um, let me just turn the camera around. Bear in mind, it's on the glass, of course. Um, but you see the whole painting. Oh God, there's a lot of reflection there. Look, the whole painting. Um, started exactly the way I, I, I started this fella here. Uh, I painted and brushed in all of the darks, even the wagon, you know, it's very easy to, if you squint guys, you've got to keep squinting, you see? If you squint while you're looking at me now, if you squint really hard, you'll probably just see, you know, a, a dark sweater and, and, you know, some dark masses. So that's what you do, you paint what you see. So those darks, when I was, I'm Many, many years ago. Uh, um, I, I'm self-taught, but I did have a year's, of when I was about 30, 12 or 13, my art master saw that there was a little bit of spark and you know, uh, you've got something there, boy, don't waste it. I'll tell you what, he said, uh, stay back after school and I'll just give you a few lessons. So I, uh, I was privileged to have a few lessons from the, my art master, who was a great teacher but he was also a really great, great artist. And he, he said to me, okay, now listen, squint, squint boy, squint. And I said, I am squint, so no, no. And he, he went to the cupboard and he got out his sunglasses. And we're inside, he put, I put the sunglasses on. He said, now squint through the sunglasses. What can you see? I said, it's just dark shapes there. Brilliant, he said, now paint what you see. And that really helped me um, because th there was a time when I was painting in my studio um, uh, and, and I'm going back, you know, I was just a wee lad then, 
um, that I'd put on a pair of sunglasses in my studio, believe it or not, and I'd set up a still life and I'd squint. And, and then, of course, all I saw was the dark values and the dark shapes. And so I painted the shapes that I saw. I painted the negative shapes and the positive shapes. And that's what I did with this fella here. I painted all those dark shapes. And, um, uh, you, you know, uh, the inside of the garage, uh, and that was quite fairly easy to do. That was fairly easy to do. But when, you ca when I came to the truck, of course, I really had to start looking through half-closed eyes. And then I popped in, you know, the radiator, the headlights, the shadow underneath, the dark shadows inside the windshield, uh, um, even, even the little wing mirrors, I painted them, you know, as dark shapes. And I built it up slowly. Uh, and I built it from dark to light. And when I came to put in the paintwork, now, the truck was not this colour, okay? It was actually not painted at all. It was an old rusted truck. And it, and, and it, uh, it was sort of, sort of dark blue and grey. And, and I thought, <clears throat> excuse me, I need to paint this truck and I want to paint it red because uh, red is my favorite color and I like to paint red and you know, every painting that I've done in the last 50 odd years has got red in it. So here we go. So I paint from dark to light. I paint the dark values and there's three dark, medium, light. And uh, that goes through my head all the time while I'm painting. It actually goes through my head when I'm out in a restaurant eating and I'm looking at things and I'm thinking, how am I going to paint that? Oh yeah, dark, medium and light values. Put the, put the darks in. So I put the dark red in, get the medium, and then I put the, the medium values and put the highlights on top. So that's how the truck came about. Now the highlights, of course, the sparkly bits of the truck where the sun is catching, you know, the chrome work on that. I didn't want to put white. Like, why would I want to put white? It would look like Somebody, the snow is falling in Taos, well, uh, in uh, Abiquiu where I was. This was high summer. I don't want to put white because that's just too blingy. So what did I use? Turquoise. I used bits of turquoise, little bits of lemon yellow. Nobody at the moment has come back and said, that's not right, my friend. You should have put sparkly white, like diamond sparkling. So take liberties, you know, uh, uh, if it's... Look, I've just painted, I've just painted these trees here. Uh, you know, they're, uh, they're grey on the on the photograph. I painted them turquoise. They're light, they're light values. And turquoise was for me that, that little bright turquoise. Excuse me. There's another a, a turquoise there. I probably could have used that, you know, to, to paint the, uh, the, the the tree. So um, like I say, I'm not a photojournalist. I don't, I don't look at the photograph and think, oh my God, I haven't got that. that look, that's a white, that's white in the water. Look, let me just turn the camera around. That, that's this, it's white there. Yeah. But this is the photograph, of course. You know, we all know that if you photograph that, look, the clouds are white, you know, the shadows are black. It's not like that in real life, of course. So, so, um, I seem to go on like, I mean, you tell me to shut up because I just ramble on and on and on. Um, oh, you do, right? <laughs> Let me just turn this around again. So you're talking to me. There we go. We're talking to me again. Um, so, yeah, uh, buildings, uh, um, uh, the truck there. Uh, it, it, I paint the same. It's the same method. I paint from dark to light, from thin paint to thick paint. Like I say, I try to, and I think I mentioned it earlier, I try to look at my subject matter, not as a truck in Abiquiu, but as a whole bunch of shapes and values to, that I put together. And if you can get your head around that every time you go out to paint and say, listen, I, I was down in, in Falmouth, down in West, right down in Cornwall, right down in the south of England, where I, where I used to live. And I painted in the evening, uh, the late evening, I was painting the sunset or the, the fading light. And I was across the estuary, I was painting the river and I looked across the river and I'm thinking, now what on earth is that? Okay, paint what you see. And I painted the shape and, uh, and I was quite happy with it. And, you, and the next day I, I went down there and I looked at the shape and it was a dumpster. I was painting a dumpster. 
okay? But, but it was the shape and, it, and it, it was an important part of the painting. Uh, um, and so, you know, like those little spots, these little spots and dots here, it's important. So that's the sort of thing that I do. I, I paint what I see, not what I know is there. So if it had been a dumpster, I'd have been, oh my God, I could put handles, I could put wheels on it and a lid. And I didn't do that. You know, I squint and I saw just this shape. It had a bit of a dark shadow on one side and a highlight. So that's what I painted. Um, the paintings are just upstairs in my lounge. It's hanging over my fireplace. So uh, um, I can't take you up there. Um, well, maybe one day I will. But uh, so uh, there's any other questions? Good. Uh, everybody's muted. Maybe yeah. Dodi could unmute everyone so they could ask questions. Well, there's some three chats there. Sorry, I have technical issues with my camera. Okay. Sorry, I have to leave. Okay. I misplaced my notes. Right. So there's there's no chats for me there. What what are your uh, favorite brands? Um, are we talking about uh, gin, or whiskey, or pastel? Who said that? Pastels. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, I was just joking here. I, I, basically, I, I have, uh, being a Brit, well, almost a Brit, I was brought up on unison. And, and so for the last 50 odd years, I've been, well, not 50, I've been painting pastel 50, but certainly 35 years, I've been using unison pastels. And then, of course, uh, um, then I was uh, introduced to Ludwig. So, so now I use unison and Ludwig. And then I wanted to have some really soft, juicy, high chrome, high pigment pastels. And that's what I moved to uh, um, Schminke. So I have a small selection of Schminke. Um, and so those are the three main uh, 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 brands that I use. However, right. however, I've suddenly started to uh, go mad and I've been buying uh, they're a little bit dusty at the moment, but but I'll bring out one. Um, uh, uh, this is the Paris Sennelier half set. And I buy the whole set, not that I use them all, but there's some wonderful colours in there. Um, and Sennelier are quite nice. Um, four, five years ago, I was invited to be guest of honour at the... Um, Salon uh, de Paris in saint Olé in the middle of France, uh, down in, in the Dordogne, um, which I went down there to be judge and um, to open the exhibition. And it's an, it was an international show. I don't speak a huge amount of French, um, uh, and uh, which was fine because, um, you know, I'll, you do a lot of hand gestures and you speak through your nose and everybody thinks you're French, which is nice. Um, but I managed to get away with it. I introduced myself and, and uh, welcomed everybody and, um, and uh, opened the exhibition and spoke about various things um, in my, in my uh, tourist French, which it worked well. Um, and the, on stage, I had the, the, the mayor of the town was there, Monsieur Le Maire, who then presented me with, he was a, a vintner, so he had his own little vineyard. He then presented me with six bottles of his of his wine, which was very pleasant. And then on the other side, there was another guy who didn't speak a word of English. And um, his name was Christian Petit, Monsieur Petit. And um, he then came up to me um, and he spoke to me in French and he was speaking very quickly. And I kept nodding and shaking my head and doing all the right things at the right time. And then he, then he turned to his assistant, which was this lovely, beautiful lady came running on with, um, uh, with uh, I'll just go and get it. She came running on to the stage and Monsieur Le Petit uh, said, uh, pour vous, Monsieur, and he gave me a full set of Giraud's. He was the chairman of Giraud Pastel. And, uh, oh my gosh. I have the full set of Gero Pastel. And they opened it up in front of me. And uh, there were, I don't know, six or 700 people out there, uh, uh, all waving and cheering and drinking champagne and saying, I'll buy them off you. I'll buy them off you. And I said, <laughs> um, So to answer your question, 
I have had these for five years, and it's only in the last year, this pandemic year, that I thought, hang on, I've got a box of Gero's around here somewhere. So I opened them up. <laughs> I opened them up. And I, I thought, holy moly, look at them. I mean, they just... Uh, 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 and I thought, I can't believe, I cannot believe that um, for five years, I've had probably $1,500 worth or more than that of pastels. Um, let me just turn back. Yeah, I mean, not the wrong one. Where did you go? Oh, I'm here. Uh, I mean, I got, look at this. And they only came out of the box. I've, I've found some toys. You know, this is like candy. I found them about a week ago. Thought, what have you been doing all this time? These are the most gorgeous pastels to use. They're unbelievably juicy and but but uh, one thing the Gero don't really make uh, uh, compared to Mr Ludwig with his firecrackers they don't make brilliant bright vivid colors but what they do have is these wonderful wonderful neutrals I mean they're just <sighs> in fact I was so excited about it well I painted a I painted a uh, my first painting with them uh, uh, last week, I think. And I actually advertised it on Facebook and I said, this painting was painted with all using Giro pastels. I, uh, and I, put, I think I put tee hee, ha ha, big claps. I, I was really excited about it. So there we are. Let's turn that around. Oh, here we go. So Giro, so there's, uh, so there's four brands. Giro. Ludwig, Unison, Minke, and now uh, uh, I found Mount Vision, the Thunderstorm set. I can't do, I buy, well, I buy two sets of them because I use them an awful lot because there's some really, really nice colours in that. I love the Thunderstorm set um, because here in Scotland, in, 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 in the winter, this time of the year, before the snows arrive, uh, um, you know, you get some really dark, and I'm up in the mountains, so those big clouds, those big thunder clouds come in, and uh, so that's nice to paint with those. Um, what else have I got? Ah, um, Aunt Spectrum. What are they called? Yeah. Oh, Aunt Spectrum Extra Soft. The Extra Soft. Yeah. They're really nice. Uh, the other ones are too hard for me. They, you know, they they got like they got like a, a like a filler in, and they got a, like a varnish on. I can't I can't do those sort of things. Um, and then, uh, well, listen, I, I'm a, my wife, when we go past a, a garden centre, the car has to stop. She goes in and buys a plant. Well, that's fine. I do the same when I go past an art shop. Oh, uh, the car stops. I have to go in and buy some pastel. I don't care what they are. I just go in and buy them. Have you got any soft pastel, say? <laughs> oh, yeah, in the corner. Okay. And I run over and, and I get a whole bunch and I, and I come out. And she'll say, oh, I thought you bought them online. I said, I know, but I'm like you with garden centers. You know, I'm with art shops. I can't go past an art shop without buying a box of pastels. But they have to be soft ones, of course. So, um, so I've got a whole collection now of, um, but generally, at, uh, I've answered your question three or four times, but generally it's Unison and Ludwig's and, and a few Schmin case thrown in. I can get Yeah, I want to know about the paper. The paper. Hi, Tony. It's Is Liz Kenyon from Phoenix, Arizona. Um, yeah. I teach with um, students, and, and I'm always having them try toned paper. Yeah. And um, I don't know what, in Arizona, the light is different. So I, I, can you hear me? You're yes, reacting, yeah, okay. So you, because of your environment, you work with dark, a dark background? I, I do, but um, let me just say that uh, October 2019, 
um, my wife kicked me out the house because uh, we were buying this place and she said, listen, um, don't uh, don't mess up the house. You know, it's ready for the realtors to come up here. Uh, you have to go somewhere. I said, well, where? She said, well, go on holiday somewhere. I said, OK, uh, what do I do. I said, OK, I'm off to Monument Valley. So I went up to uh, to to Monument Valley and and painted up there. And I got a whole bunch of Monument Valley paintings, all of them painted on dark toned paper. All of them painted on either uh, the dark brown um, um, card or got a pastel premiere. Um, okay. And so it doesn't matter which environment I'm in, Liz, uh, um, I, I use the dark paper. Um, the lightest paper I do go for is the Italian clay pastel premiere. And also, um, I'm just going to get a piece out, and you won't believe this, but uh, I'll probably paint on red. Yeah, so, I love red. I love red. And, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, one thing I don't paint on, I don't paint on white. Um, I ordered, I went online and ordered my paper from my supplier here, um, and I ordered some uh, some uh, uh, color fix paper. Yeah. Spectrum color fix, which I use for quite some. I don't use it anymore. Anyway, I clicked the button and I said, send me 20 sheets of this. And, and then when it arrived, I clicked on the wrong, uh, 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 you know, on the wrong product. I ended up with 20 sheets of white color fix. Oh, no. I thought, I can't do this. I can't paint on this. Um, and so, uh, so I gave it all away, except one sheet. I kept one sheet back for myself. Um, and I painted, but I gave it all away. I, I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. Uh, I got a whole bunch of um, UART, oatmeal UART in there, which is ready to be painted on. Um, but I still like to mess it up a bit, you know, and, and right. rub some stuff over it. Otherwise, it's just too, it's just too bright. It's the same as when I paint in oils. You know, I get my canvas out. And the first thing I do is destroy all that white canvas. I got to get rid of it, sure. you, know? you know. It's, it's, it blinds you. In, in my demo yesterday in front of my students, I made an underpainting on the UART board, uh, 500 grit, and I did it with these little blocks of um, watercolor. They look like little uh, pieces of soap, flat pieces of soap. Yeah. And you just apply a light coat of it. And then when you add water, it just explodes with really intense I know. Uh, watercolor underpainting and it dries really quickly, um, you might, too bad you threw away that white paper. <laughs> uh, of course, I do paint on, on hardboard as well, uh, which is my own prepared service. You know, if I'm going to paint big, you know, up to sort of four or five foot. Right. I'll go up to the, uh, up to the hardware store and get some, and get some hardboard. Um, or some MDF, maybe some three mil MDF, uh, three mil in, in your money, it's about, I don't know, an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch or something. That, right. You know. uh, and what I do is that then I prepare it with, with a, um, I prepare it with gesso and pumice powder and what have you. Okay. And then what I do is I do stain it with acrylic. So uh, just right. you know, acrylic paint, because acrylic paint is like bulletproof, you know, I mean, once it's right. on, you you know, you can hit it with a pickaxe and it won't come off. Right. Uh, so it, that is bulletproof. Uh, and then with the pumice powder, of course, uh, you get that nice, that right. nice mixture. Now, the other thing that I use with my, and I'm going to get it, I'm just going to go off camera and I'm going to get it, but I'm going to carry on talking. When I'm using the, um, the hardboard and, and the, um, with the pumice powder is, um, uh, sometimes if I don't use acrylic to stain the board, I have um, Spectrofix. Okay. Okay, Spectrofix, which is a Cassian base. And the way I use this is I may get, um, I may get a, a, a dark pastel out, you know, look, look at this one here, dark Prussian blue. And I just make a few right. marks all over. Then I yeah. squirt. Then I get my hand and I and I you know it's like making pastry and I get really heavily into that. So oh. I 
both hands and I can put a red and then and yeah, I just yeah cool. you know what I, and it dries this stuff dries pretty quickly yeah and a really good base and so you that's, put that on what again that's on I, I, I use that when I paint big I paint on MDF right. yeah MDF which you know I sand slightly I you know put a little bit of a key on it and then uh, and then a bit the other thing that I use as well, rather than use gesso on my MDF, I would use um, water-based wood stain. Oh, cool. <laughs> That's a good idea. A wood, wood stain, like, like maybe something like a dark, a dark walnut or something like that. Right, right. And, and I just brush it all over the over the board, and so you end up with a sort of nice sort of sort of dark sort of brown warm sienna, yeah. And then with the grit on as well, of course, I I, I mix the you know the uh, pumice powder and then paint that on, paint a few coats of that so it's nice and gritty, and then that that's another thing. But and this works well with the wood stain as well. Yeah, cool. Can we switch now to one other question? Yep. Do we have time? Cool. There are, okay, I know that you you are a master at calligraphy, at mark making, with your pastel. Okay. I, I'm I'm sitting there going, is he high on something? Because <laughs> you take yeah, your I, hand dances around yeah. while you're holding that stick. Yeah. So where did you learn that? That's your own personal sort of like I say calligraphy. How did you learn how to do that? Well, Liz, I was a watercolorist for 20 years before I moved on to oils and pastels. And, and uh, as a watercolorist, I, I, was, um, I never used to use a pencil to draw out and map out the design. Right. Um, I, and I still have the, the brushes here, my sable brushes, perhaps a number eight or number 10 sable, which in those days cost me a fortune. And I did buy one brush. I think it cost me about 48 pounds. And I'm going back many, many years. I never told my wife how much I spent. You know, it was like the whole <laughs> one brush for crying out loud. She, if she'd have known that, I, I, I'd have been divorced. However, <laughs> so I never used to draw and map out my design as a watercolorist. I would simply, and I would always paint with the easel upright and not flat on the table. Right. And I was always, you know, I, I'd go straight in with the color and I'd squint and I'd flick it around. Uh, a number, number 10 sable, you know, which is quite fat, but a good sable, you can get a nice point. And then you can start to play around with those nice little calligraphy lines, you know. Okay. I do that. Um, and, um, and I think, the other thing is, Liz, is that, um, and I've been painting for, you know, I'm 172 years old now, so right. I've been painting for a long time. Um, but uh, the most important thing, uh, and I'm going to do an interview soon uh, for another society, and one of the questions is almost like what you've just asked. And the answer is, is I practice, practice, practice daily. I practice all the time. If I'm not painting, I'm sketching and doodling. If I'm at, uh, having my breakfast, there always appears to be a pencil next to me and a paper, and I'm sketching and playing and designing and you know, making shapes. And so it's important. You said, is he high on something? Well, actually, I am, because I, I'm, I'm addicted to painting and sketching. Um, I'm just going to turn the camera around. If you guys have got time, I don't know you have, if you have or not. I'm just going to turn the camera around once more and go over here. Now, over here, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine shelves full of sketchbooks. I mean, I'm talking of sketchbooks. Now, let me just turn the camera around once more. Move that out of the way. I've just picked one out. 
And I'm gonna flip through and there's a whole bunch of thumbnails. Venice, oh, Venice Fish Market, 1987. I don't know how many years ago. That's not far off 40 years ago. Yeah. Um, it, it is full of sketches. Now, that's just one book out of 60 or 70 there. Yeah. Now, if I get stuck, you see, this is why I don't normally use photographs to paint from. I, I usually, if I'm painting from life and, and planning, that's fine. But if I'm normally, if I'm painting, I use my sketches. I use my sketchbook. I, oh. I sketch. I'm in a, when I went to Venice not so long ago, I had to go to Venice uh, uh, and do a workshop in, in Croatia. And I got to, and I, the easiest way was to go to Venice first and then get the ferry across the Adriatic. Simple. I got to Venice. I was there a whole day waiting for the ferry, which would lend a sort of four o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. Well, what do you do? apart from drink wine and eat pasta all day in Venice, you sketch, you know, uh, uh, it's a place where you can't, you're addicted to it. I get addicted. The minute I land, the pencil comes out and the sketch, I'm sketch, sketch, sketch. Uh, and so, uh, and so that's what I did. I, I spent the whole day sketching. And when I got to the workshop um, in Croatia, the following day, we opened the workshop. And the first thing I did was to take out the sketchbook and say, OK, this is what we did. You know, this is what I did yesterday. I hope you guys have been sketching. And then we started to paint the workshop. Now, that's just black and white sketches. These are color sketches. Wow. Oh, oh look, there's some Monument Valley sketches. Yeah. These are ink. Felt pens, marker pens, ink, and gouache. Yeah. Okay, watercolor. So there's a whole bunch. Look, there's some more there. Very yeah. simple. Very simple sketch. Oh, look, there's a, France. This is France. Um, now, sketching and drawing. I, I mean, this is going to turn into a whole session here. Of, of I hope you guys listen. If you've got, if you've got, to, if you've got to go to the shop in. Off you go and tell me to, to clear off. I, I'll clear off. But sketching and drawing is the ABC of painting. It's the language of painting. We, could, we all learned a language when we were two or three, three or four years old. We, we were, it was very easy. We learned a language. We learned to speak. You want to learn to paint? You've got to learn the language. And it's the, the language of painting is sketching sketching and drawing and i say that is because let's get back to my 1987 oh here we are 1987 whole bunch of thumbnails right the fish market now i'm going to do this backwards now it's like scratching your head and rubbing your tummy at the same time <laughs> so here we are um uh, there yeah there's, there's a few people there uh, um, walking up the steps. Now, we could, in those days, I didn't have an iPhone, and uh, but we could have got a camera, click. Right. Okay, I'll paint that in a couple of years' time. Um, you don't have to think. The camera does all the work for you. The camera records everything. You just click. You can even do it without looking. You can point the camera and talk to your friend and click. Right. Now, if you're sketching, of course, you've got to use this. You've got to use the observation. Painting is 70% observation and 30% application. So to sketch and draw your subject that's in front of you, you first of all have to see the values, see the shapes, start painting the shapes, find the perspective, look at the angles, look at the distance, look at the reflected light, always measuring all oh, the top of the head is in level with that window. Yes, I'll put the window. So you're all the time concentrating and taking this information in. This brain and this head has been doing that for many, many years, 50 odd years plus. And even though it's old and it's dying off, it can still 
get memory recall. I can still go to my sketchbook, open up a sketch, and then look and say, I remember that day because I spent an hour taking in all of the information that was there. I could see it all. I can, you know, I can, some of these Venice, I, I can smell the pasta that was next to me in the restaurant while I was, you know what I'm saying, Liz? It's, yeah. It, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, it, it's, it, it's so easy for the camera to take all that away from you. Right. I'm not anti-camera, I mean, by all means take, I mean, I've just taken all these photographs. By all means take the photograph. But this is why I have my little right. easel with my value sketches on. Look, this is the, there's a whole bunch of them. They're all under this. Oh, look, there's one there. There's one there. So I turn my photographs into value sketches if I'm certainly in workshops. So we look at the photograph and we analyze it and we, and we, you know, we, and then we, then I work from the value sketches all the time. Um, for this exercise, of course, we only had a half an hour and you guys wanted to see what the hell is he painting and what, what's going on here. So that's why we had the photograph up there. But I don't generally use the photograph. If, if I do use the photograph, it's really just to check on one or two issues and, and details that I, that I. Right, right. Got. Makes you legitimate. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, the trouble with, and I keep saying it, the, the trouble with, I've done some private lessons for, for, for a few people, you know, over the last few months. And, and I've said, you've got to be careful when you look at your image, by all means, look at the photograph, but don't take it literally because right. you copy pixels, you know, it pick, yeah. pick, not like that in real life. So just be careful when you look at the colors you've seen. I spoke, to, nobody works for Apple here, but I spoke to somebody in my workshop a couple of years ago who worked for Apple and they said, your brand new iPhone has got a bit of software in it that automatically photoshops it and makes the colors of your photographs. Oh, no. <laughs> no. And I've, I've never forgotten that. I have to, so just be careful because the, sometimes the colors you see on your, certainly on your phone or your Apple and your, your iPhones, are not really the true colors in life because you've got to think about right. reflection. Mm -hmm. So when, what did you say, Tony, were the three things you used, ink and gouache, and what was the other thing to make the sketch? You said, uh, well, you, well, oh, well, these color sketches. Yeah, what did you it, use again? Yeah, um, well, see that Monument Valley one there? Yeah. So that's got uh, um, black marker pen ink, and gouache, which is the, the highlight, but I've also got pastel pencils. I got a whole bunch of them uh, somewhere around. Oh, here we go. I bought a little, I bought a, a you know, a 36 of these Carbothello pastel pencils. Um, and so, so I can use those. So those are the, look, there's another one there that's got ink, gouache, and, and a bit of pastel pencils. Pastel pencil, okay. You know, when I'm talking about, uh, um, I'm talking about some, some of the nibs are this big, you know, they're like oh, big, wow. big fat boys like that. And then, and then some of them are, 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 are little fellas oh, like that. Uh -huh. yeah. um, and then what happens when you're actually doing this? Do people, um, do people say anything to you or, or like, what are you doing drawing me? Or are you get any feedback that way or? Yeah, yeah. A, a lot of people, um, usually look over your shoulder, you know, and say, oh, you're clever. And you say, <laughs> uh, but uh, if you have headphones in, they don't say anything. Oh, no, I meant like, um, well, like the ones with the people going up the steps. It seems like they would be up the steps in a way before you could get the whole sketch done. Ah, uh, well, uh, here we go. Is another demo coming up by the looks of it. <laughs> oh. Well. No, it's not interesting. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Well, let's just put something up here then. Look, that's, that's the Comrie tree I painted the other day. 
Um, let me just get a fresh bit of paper out. God, if I can find the piece. People walk out. So the you're saying that these things are very quick. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah. God, I've got no paper left. Yes. Generally, oh, here's a piece here. Yeah. Uh, Sharon, it's yeah. All the fact I don't do any of this, and I, I think this is very interesting. Maybe I could try it. Well, well, let's just turn the camera around and let's just see what we can do. Uh, now we've, <laughs> um, let, let's think about this carefully. So, so you know, you're talking about um, those people walking up the steps. Um, yeah. So we're here in Venice, and um, there's a whole bunch of people around, of course. Uh, right. And, and like, they're not the only two people walking up the steps. You know, there's a whole bunch of them waiting to, to, to follow them. And so, oh. so you... Okay. There's one person there. Oh, you can't... Oh. <laughs> I don't know if you can oh. see it. Okay. Yeah. There's one person there. Uh, walking up the steps. Um, uh, uh, there's his wife next to him. Uh, uh, so, so there they go. As they disappear into the distance, of course, you can always say, oh, hang on a minute. She had a red dress on, so that'll do. Uh, uh, but that's enough. Uh, oh, there's somebody else walking down there. Oh, there's another person there. Uh, they're a bit closer, so I obviously have to be slightly bigger. Um, <laughs> walking up the steps, well. And there's the steps. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. Now there's no magic to it. It's not. It's not. You know, there's no mirrors. It's, it's you know, I'm not. Uh, uh, what's his name? The guy who can make a, a jumbo jet disappear. Um, there's, it's not rocket science. It's what did I say before? It's seventy percent observation and thirty percent application. And so, so when you're when you're, listen. Um, I was down when I was down in Cornwall. Uh, um, we might now. Um, and um, actually, I'm not going to say down in corner. I'm going to go and paint the Comrie tree, which I just show, I've just shown you there. The Comrie tree. Now, Comrie is the next village to me, and I painted this tree. Um, uh, I pass it every day, of course. My daughter lives in Comrie, is seven miles away, and, and I drive along the road, and I, we go and, you know, we have a cup of tea, we have a chat, and then when I come back home, I saw this, and I st the light was just about right, you know? It was late, uh, late afternoon, the sun was setting, uh, the casting long shadows, and I saw the Comrie tree. I thought, well, now, why have I not painted this? Quickly, sketch. Um, and then, so I painted the Comrie tree. I'm not going to paint it again, but but it, you can hopefully you can see it there. It was dark one side, um, light the other. So I, I got out some, you know, I got my little other pastels out here. Oh, this here it is. Look at this this new pastel. Dark, light, and then I got a, a, another wee pastel there, which was um, a unison pastel. Uh, a few marks for the cornfield. And I thought, that's what, what we need to paint, the Conway tree. Huh. It's around here somewhere. Well, you did that. Didn't you put it on Facebook? I did. I put it on Facebook. You can have a look on Facebook. Have a look on my page and you just and just scan yeah. down the Conway tree there. Um, but it, it was, uh, so it, it's, it's a very quick, uh, you know, it's a very quick process, but the, the reason is because 
let me just turn myself around again. Otherwise you're talking to a blank piece of paper. The reason why it's quick and it's not magic is, and I've said this many times in my workshops, is that you can spend all your money and I have on all the reference books. And then I've got some DVDs, which I've bought over the years. And I've been and, and watched people paint. And so what I've done, I've got gained all the knowledge from the books, the DVDs and watching people to paint. And you think, well, that's fantastic. But actually, without practice, 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 all of that amounts to nothing. All it amounts to is you've got a good collection of books and wow, you've got a... <laughs> <laughs> so without practice, 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 it will amount to nothing. It's a bit like saying, I want to learn to speak Italian. Or I want to play the piano. Okay, well, let's watch a whole bunch of videos and let's watch and say, yeah, let's get a book out now, read about pianos. But if you don't sit down and tickle the ivories, you're never going to be a pianist, you know? <laughs> so, so, and that's why, you know, sketching to me, where's one? Oh, here we go. Sketching to me is very important. You know, when I was... I'm going to turn the camera around again now. This is hard work. You see. Um, <laughs> when I was um, uh, uh, down in uh, down in the West Country, when I lived down down south, um, I was out uh, down at the fishing harbour uh, and at uh, low tide. And there, of course, uh, you know, uh, was this was this boat, this fishing boat, and, and I was painting it. And I thought this would be fun, so I, I'm painting the, 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 this boat here, this fishing boat. And um, and there was another one there, I, I think. And so we'll put that one in as well. And just at that moment, while well, I'm getting into this, the fisherman walks along and he's in his boat and he decides that he's going to stand right in front of me and start, you know, looking after his boat, tending his boat. And I thought to myself, oh, OK. So, um, right, well, here he is. Let's put him in then. So while... <laughs> I better put him in, and so so uh, out came out came the um, out came the pastels, and I you can't quite see that. Oh, you can possibly. Uh, out came uh, uh, the little sticks of um, pastel pencils, and put in the boat, uh, put in the, the fisherman. You know, it was important to get that in. So um, he was an addition now to, to the painting. Uh, and I mean, and once he was in, um, you can then, oh, there's somebody over there. Oh, actually, I quite like that figure. I'm going to add that person in there. So, you know, you can add uh, uh, this other guy. And he was there sort of pulling on some ropes or something. So, it, you know, it, it's all to do with um, com make confident mark making. Confident mark. That's a good word I'm going to use. Confident mark making. Yeah. Don't be frightened. Don't be frightened to. Um, don't be frightened to make a mistake as well. Look, look he's got a blue shirt on. So, so let's just put a blue shirt on. Now, um, if I can get it close on personal, but you can hopefully you can see it. I mean. I used that size brush and I made one mark, two marks, and he's got a blue shirt. Um, I wasn't too interested in whether, you know, whether he had a tie on or, uh, and, uh, but look, we can put another mark there to say, that's where the light is coming from. So I'm gonna put a lighter blue there. Now we've gone back to what I've said earlier, dark, medium, and light values. So there's the three values on that one person. <laughs> Hopefully, um, it looks like a human. Um, because Tony. there are... Oh. Yes. Tony, this is Jody Valentine. Uh, you yeah. mentioned a minute ago, uh, don't be afraid of making a mistake. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Everybody? Can. Okay. <laughs> I had to switch from my computer to my iPad and I just wanted to be sure. Um, I was going to uh, 
uh, I wanted to say a quote that I saw uh, on the front page of your website, which meant a lot to me. And I, I think it fits so perfectly right now. It says there, these are your words, the quest for perfection can bring with it fear of making mistakes and can result in a style which can seem inhibited. Okay, I went, I strike a, uh, strike me right in the heart when I read that. And I think we have watched you very generously as a master at what you do and passionate at what you do, that you do have done it so intensely all these years for too many of us, we're just uh, yeoman by comparison. And for many of us, the idea of perfection is having it just look, look just like what we see. That is sort of what we're aiming for to get perfection, but you have made your own perfection as an artist, as truly an artist who has taken in what you see and what you give us is something different than just what you see. They're oh. here. That's yep. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So very nice, Dodie. Thank you for saying that. And she's <laughs> completely correct, Tony. You you actually have a style that you've of your own that goes beyond what is just right there, but captures it in mm -hmm. spirit and emotion. And, and we honor you because we see how much you put into creating that style all these years. You, you didn't wake up doing it this way. Your passion and your intensity <laughs> has made it work. So you have honored us with all the time you spent. We've, this has been a great treat. It yeah. has been a great treat. Thank you, Tony. Well, well, Tony, I think we should probably sometime in the future, when you can get back to the United States again, uh, set you up with a little bit of a workshop or something, don't you think? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm due to come back next April, but but uh, all my workshops, of course, were cancelled because of COVID. Now mm -hmm. they're being reinstated and they're, and they're sort of rising like Phoenix. What Phoenix? They're like <laughs> rising like... <laughs> And so now I'm I'm due back and I'm up in Dakota Arts and then I'm down all the way down the West Coast, California. Uh, um, and um, and then I'm doing the plein air convention in Santa Fe. Uh, so um, 2022 is I've worked out that from March through to October, I'm doing a workshop every single month in four wow. different countries. I'm in Australia. I'm in. Uh, the UK, <laughs> UK. I'm in America, and in France, um, and so um, 2022 is going to be a really busy time for me. But hopefully, if I get a bit of if I get a bit of time, and um, and I'm I'm not far from from Arizona, I'll be in Santa Fe. Um, it would be great to pop in for an afternoon or a day and stay in the night somewhere. Now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, that would be wonderful. Perhaps we could do like a little uh, daytime, um, a one day workshop and a nighttime barbecue. What we Something. did here, it'll be fun. It'll be fun. Well, you let us know if you have a slot then, right? right? I, I, I intend to take some time out between those workshops in the USA next year. Um, and who knows, wouldn't it be nice just to say, well, let's just pop along to Phoenix and see the yeah. guy. <laughs> yep, that's right. Dry out. Yeah, that's very good. And that's I know just, you're good friends with Las Vegas too, and they're just up the road from us. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's, I mean, good idea. Was, I know. Um, at the moment, I've I've got some work on display in Russia at the moment, which is really nice. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that's through the Red Rocks uh, Pastels right. Society. Of course, they they put on this thing in Penza, and so I've got three paintings there, and they've been in Penza, which is a town about. I don't know, 600 kilometers south of Moscow. Um, but uh, uh, next week, the work is all going to be moved and to another exhibition actually in the city itself in Moscow. So I'll be on display and well, I won't be on display, of course. The world. <laughs> Which is it's been wonderful, wonderful having you here. Looking yes. at your big smile, 
Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. It's yeah. wonderful. Tony, what we what we are offering you as a small um, thank you is certainly in nowhere deserving of what you just gave us. So I'm saying to my group, hopefully they might all send you their own little email of thank you and tell you how much this has meant to us. Well then we will we will allow you to unwind and pull your <laughs> covers up over your head and we got, appreciate what you did very, I, very much. Yeah. I gotta, I gotta jump in the shower. So there's no way I can jump into bed. But... <laughs> <laughs> all right myself a glass of wine before all right all right let's give him a round of applause everyone thank you very much Yay, Tony. <laughs> Yay, fabulous. Thank, you. thank you wonderful wonderful thank yes. you thank you thank you Tony. <laughs>